Heavenly Father, we're thankful for, um, for this space and this place. We are thankful for the work that you have been doing in, in our fellowship. We're thankful for the work that you did in this young church in Corinth and um, the work that you did through Paul. And it's just amazing that we can, we can look back thousands of years ago and we can learn such practical things as we look to become a more faithful church here in Tiffin, Lord. And as we dig into this chapter tonight, um, Lord, I think that this is probably one of the toughest chapters that I have read in a while. But I know that you have it here for a reason. I know that you have it here for a purpose. And so, Lord, I pray for each one of us tonight that we would have ears to hear what you have to say. Give us boldness to take action. And Lord, as we just devour 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let it be written on our hearts, Lord. So Lord, do your thing tonight. Holy Spirit, take over because we need you. Surely don't want to hear from me tonight, Lord. We came here because we want to hear from you. And so as we open up your word, do your thing with it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So our title of our time tonight is going to be Put Down the Hammer. Put Down the Hammer. We are, again, we're, as we're going through wisdom and warnings through 1 Corinthians, there are five warnings that we are going to be looking at, and this one is on unity, and it crescendos tonight. Everything that we have been learning about, making sure that we stay away from division and we run to unity, it comes to a warning tonight that is, one of the commentators said, is one of the most scary verses in the New Testament. We've looked at this first warning and we have said, okay, this is, Paul is talking to the church, he's talking to Christians, and remember we used that little Lego house and we looked on and we said, as we become believers, we are being built into a temple, And so we're talking about that temple tonight. And um, I want you to think about that unity or uh, division is like somebody taking a jackhammer to the foundation of your house. right? And just imagine that if you were in your house and you heard this very loud sound coming from outside and you ran outside and how furious you would be if your neighbor was sitting there with a jackhammer to the foundation of your house. And you go, dude, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, don't worry. I'm just, I'm venting. I'm just venting. You go, you, you need to stop that. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm venting. This is how I vent. Right? You would get to the point where you would go, okay, listen, I'm going to have to go and get somebody else. Maybe you would call the police and you'd bring somebody in to help to scare this guy a little bit. And you would get to the point where you would say to this guy, I'm going to have to take you out with force if you don't stop jackhammering the foundation of my house. That's exactly what is happening here, but it's Jesus' house. And we, when we start bringing division into the church, we are a jackhammer onto Jesus' house. And like the great theologian Captain America says to Thor, bro, put down the hammer. So do we. Can you tell that we're watching a lot of superhero stuff these days? (laughs) We have to be careful because this is, we'll learn tonight, is that when it comes to Jesus' temple... Jesus' church, he doesn't mess around. Just like we wouldn't with our house. You wouldn't just sit there and let somebody mess with your foundation. And Jesus won't either. And so let's, um, let's dig into it. It says in verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? 
So we're going to break this chapter down into four sections tonight. And the four sections will be division. <clears throat> division is effect is an effect of stagnation. Division distracts, division destroys, and division deceives. And so point number one is that division is an effect of stagnation. All right, he goes on and he's, Paul's talking about here, he's talking about this being carnal. Okay, and the best way that I could describe what he's about to say is somebody that has become stagnant. Stagnant means that you're staying put and you're not moving. And Paul looks on and he says, listen, this is seriously a bad place for you to be. Now, if you remember back to, remember when we were going through Romans and we use those two cups to show what it, lo- what it looks like to live a life in Adam and to live a life in Christ. Okay, the person that is stagnant is the one that they've been born again, the Lego, remember we took the Lego out and we put it into the other one that is in Christ. But some people never truly understand that. They still live a life like they're in Adam a life according to the flesh, and they never truly have freedom that's in Jesus. That's exactly what's happening with this group, with this church, is that they think that they're spiritual, but they're actually, they haven't grown in a really long time. And so he uses this really cool metaphor, and look at what he says. He talks about, do you guys ever, have you ever heard anybody say at a, at a church Bible study, listen, this is going to be like a meat and potatoes, this isn't just going to be milk? That kind of is like where we get it from right here because he uses the metaphor of a baby in milk. And he's saying you need to move on. Now what's interesting is little Harbor Grace, okay, right now she is dependent solely on milk. She crushes it all the time. And you could look on at her life and she right now has explosive growth. She will double in size in this age that she's in. Think about your your body. How many times does that happen where you literally doubled your weight? Now, people could look on at Harbor Grace and go, wow, you are growing so much. Look at all of this. But Harbor Grace is going to get to a point, and it's coming very soon, where milk is not going to do it for her anymore. She is going to have to move on to food. If she doesn't move on to food, she's not going to grow. That's exactly how it is in the Christian life. You can have milk for a season. And when Megan and I gave our lives to Jesus, we were babes in Christ. We had no idea what we were doing. We had no idea how to read the Bible. We had no idea how to study the Bible. We were all over the place. We were, you know, sometimes we're just like, you know, we'll just open it up and see where it takes us and let the wind blow open a page and that's where the Lord wants me, you know, and just milk. And the, the bad thing is, is that you can't do that for very long. You have to get to the point where you're getting some nutrition. <clears throat> you have to realize that all of us in the Christian life, we get hungry. Milk is very, very nutritious for a little while. But there comes to a point where it's really good with cookies and things like that, but it cannot be your main course anymore. Now you say, well, what in the world is the main course? Paul defines it for us later. Let me, let me uh, share what he says in the book of Hebrews. He says, for though by this time, I'm sorry, Paul, uh, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We think that it very well could be Paul. It sure looks like it. Um, In Hebrews, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of a full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice what he says there when he's describing it is, he talks about the word of righteousness. So if you want to know what food is, it is the word. Remember, Paul says in Acts 20, 27, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole, the whole counsel of God. The way that you get nutrition 
in your diet with the Lord is that you have to go through this. And you can't hang out in just Proverbs for all of your time in the Word. You can't hang out in just Ephesians. You guys got to get some Genesis and some Exodus and some Leviticus in your diet. You need some Deuteronomy. You need Numbers. And you need Joshua. And you need First and Second Samuel. You need Chronicles. You need all the way up to Revelation. Just as badly as you need the book of John. And it's my job each time that we come together to mix that all together. I'm a chef. So each time we come together, I usually bring some milk for those in the room that are still drinking milk. But I also, it's my job to bring the meat and potatoes. Now the nice thing about why we love Calvary Chapel so much is that that's the way that the whole entire thing is set up. When you say we're going to go from the beginning to the end, it leaves me to a point where I can't skip anything. And so we literally have to cover, cover from the first verse all the way till the end. And what happens is you end up getting a full course meal. And that's the beauty of studying the Bible from front to back. You go, well, I can't do that. Anytime that I've started, I do well in Genesis. I get to Exodus. I'm doing pretty sweet. And then I get to Leviticus. And it's like, what in the world is going on? Listen, you got to think about it like your veggies. Sometimes you got to find a way to put in some salt, put some sugar in, find some commentators that may help with the things that you don't understand. That's exactly what Megan and I were, were doing when we became young believers. At first, we had no idea what was going on. I would kind of just rush through a book of the Bible. Sometimes I'd take like two or three in one sitting. And then I got to the point where I had to slow down, figure out what I was digesting. I found a commentator that I really enjoyed, and he helped me through things like Leviticus. And I realized that Leviticus is just as important as the book of Matthew. And he made it interesting because he went through Leviticus chapter 14 and he pointed it to Jesus. And I started to realize that every single verse, every single chapter, every single word in Scripture declares the glory of God. You just got to go in and find it. So if you get bored, find another way to do it. It's just like food. You can't just, you know, you can't just get to a point where you just go, I'm just going to eat cotton candy my whole life because that's what I like. But the thing is, is that that's what we tend to do with the Scripture. And, and, and unfortunately, we can get into this rut where we just go, let me stick to this verse and I'll just hang out there. That would be no different than Harbor Grace being seven years old and still be drinking milk all the time. We would look on and we would go, man, at one point you were growing, but right now you're stagnant. So Paul looks on at this group and he says, listen guys, I, I mean, I, I wanted to be able to give you more but at that time, you could only have milk. And the sad thing is, you still can only have milk. <clears throat> now, he goes on to describe and define what living carnality is, carnally. He says, <clears throat> let's go back and read it. He says, verse 3, he says, For you are still carnal. Now, you could circle that word carnal and right next to it write flesh. Now remember, that's that Romans 7 Christian. A person living after the flesh is the one that's living for their own desires. Now he defines that for us. He says, For they, where there are envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal in behaving like men? As we look back on our study in Romans, we realize that we're not supposed to live a life in the flesh. And you, you can't. You're always going to stay stagnant if you're trying to do things on your own. The Holy Spirit has to come inside of us. And the Holy Spirit is the one that starts reacting in ways that are different to our nature. If you have anger, the Holy Spirit wants to come in and give you kindness. If you can't control yourself, the Holy Spirit can come in and give you control where you never had control. And we get to a point where we start to realize, I am nothing without the Holy Spirit. That's Romans chapter 8, remember? That that's the way that we should be in our lives. <clears throat> the way to consistently be filled 
to be taught and to be led by the Holy Spirit is by spending time with Jesus and in His Word. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our guide. I was talking with a guy yesterday. He says, how do you hear from the Lord? And I said, well, I hear from Him right here. He says, okay, but how does that, like, how does that practically work? I said, well, the way that I talk to God is through prayer. He goes, so do you actually take your Bible with you into your study time? I, I do. I pray to the Lord, and I read, and the Lord speaks to me. He goes, well, how do you know that He's actually speaking to you? Well, it, it says that this Word is living. So there is something that the Lord has for every single one of us when we sit down and we dig into this thing. It's the amazing thing about a life in Jesus. I can't tell you how many things for this study tonight the Lord just handed to me this week. Because that's what He does. Especially when you come to Him and say, Lord, guide me and direct me. If we don't feed our bodies with spiritual food, we will feed it with fleshly food. I know that fleshly is kind of like a Christianese word, but it's something that we have to start getting used to. <clears throat> it means that we're living of the world, and that's the, not, not the type of, of life that we are called to live. So let's just go through those real quick. He, he defines it as envy, strife, and division. Envy, another word for envy, is jealous. Strife is somebody that's arguable, contentious. And a person that is a divider or division is one that's always looking to separate things. Let's be real about church for a minute, especially within our country. It is no joke that the church is divided. We're divided on almost everything. I was talking to a family member today. He's talking about how in his church, in their denomination, they are going through a vote that no matter what happens, they're going to be divided. And as I was reading it this week, I was just so grieved by that because that was never supposed to happen. That was never the plan. Denominations were never supposed to be a thing. Jesus, remember when he was praying to his heavenly Father, he asked that the church would be one just like the Holy Spirit and the Heavenly Father and Him are one. You say, well, so does that mean that we're all just supposed to be in one place and just be one church? Listen, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with different flavors of church. And when I talk about church, I'm talking about ones that we agree on the big issues. There are, there are groups of people that will call themselves a church. If they don't believe that Jesus is the, the Christ, the Messiah, is God, that's not who I'm referring to here. If they don't believe that Mary can, was conceived or conceived Jesus as a, as a, and had a virgin birth, then we, we've got some issues. So there is some rules that we have when we, and what I'm talking about is that group of people. The Lord wanted us to be one and not to gossip about each other and not to become, remember in Corinth, they're just doing a popularity contest and the Lord looks on and he goes, I never wanted it like that. And there's nothing wrong with different flavors. Right? There's some churches where they have tambourines and they jump around and they dance. And there's times where I wish that we were like that. There's other churches where they all stand anytime that they read the Word of God in reverence to Him. There's some churches where they have somebody come up and read the Scripture, then another guy gets up and does the message. And you look on it, you go, that's just a different flavor. And there's nothing wrong with that. People look on at Calvary all the time and go, so you guys really just spend most of church service just studying the Bible? Like, yeah, that's our flavor. That's what we really enjoy doing. Contemporary Christian music really, you know, has, has, has made a way of dividing people, but it's really just a way to do your flavor. Some people like choruses. Some people like live bands. Some people have dancers. You know, you look around and people are now writing articles about this church is into this and this church is into that. And hey, Ben, what do you think about Hillsong? And hey, Ben, what do you think about Jesus culture? Listen, here's what I can tell you. If you were to ask me privately, yeah, there's probably some things that we disagree on. But I can't tell you how Hillsong has ministered to me as a person and has ministered to our church. When we were in our home, we, we did worship on a TV. And guess who we played a lot of the time? 
Hillsong United, Elevation, Bethel, Jesus Culture, Chris Tomlin, all of those guys. So if you were to ask me, man, like what, what effect have they had on your life? They've been a huge blessing to me. Now, yeah, do I disagree? I disagree with how other Calvaries do things. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to take a sledgehammer and start dividing. Right? So, so we have to be very, very careful when it comes to denominations. We have to be very, very careful to how we look on at that because it's Jesus' church. <clears throat> We have to realize that we are different flavors. And there's nothing wrong with a, a group meeting over here and doing things a little bit different. And a group meeting over here and doing things a little bit different. The last thing is, our diet is an indicator of where we are with Jesus. Right? What, what he has basically said in this first section is, if you are stagnant, if you are immature in the Lord, the fruit of that is that you can look on it at your life. And if I see jealousy, if I see arguing, and I see division, that means that you have a bad diet of milk right now. And you start to realize, wow, those that are mature in the faith, they're the ones that stay away from jealousy. They're the ones that stay away from arguing and quarreling. And they are the ones that stick to unity. So here's the action item for our first point is what's your diet? If you were to look back at this last week or this last month, are you right now drinking milk like Harbor Grace? Or are you getting some meat and potatoes some Brussels sprouts, some veggies. What does your diet look like? And here's my challenge to you. Establish a healthy diet and eat. And if you need to, put some salt and some sugar on it, especially when it comes to the veggies. Let's continue. Verse 5. He says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you've believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellows workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which has been given to me, a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which... Um, so, oh man, I just skipped my spot. For no other foundation can anyone lay... Then what each is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Point number two tonight is that, man, division distracts. Division distracts. Now, what we have to realize is that we can't be distracted by the big picture. Jesus is calling us into ministry with him and through him. All right, so what he is saying to this to this young church is guys, don't get distracted with popularity contests and these types of things because you are partnering with the Lord. You have got work to do. Second thing that we realize in this section is Diversity is needed within the body. Listen, diversity has become one of those like hot button words that people can twist or get really upset or make sure that it's happening. But let me just say, 
We need diversity. And actually, we love diversity. If you're a person that says we don't need diversity, look at your refrigerator. You don't eat the same thing every day. You need other things. And you like other things. And it's the same way in the body of Christ. When he puts together a church, he he brings a diverse group of people together with diverse talents. And we need each other. And that's what happens when he starts bringing people together. <clears throat> now it's really interesting, but if you've noticed here, he says, listen, one plants and another waters. Now this is literally happening for him. Now, as he is planted in Corinth, Apollos was in Ephesus. Now, do you remember where Paul goes to after he leaves Corinth? He leaves Corinth and he goes to Ephesus. Apollos leaves Ephesus and he comes to Corinth. So it's literally happening. He's planning and right over here, Apollos is planning. Then he goes and waters and Apollos comes over here and he waters. And what he's trying to get them to understand is, listen, guys, you're, you're trying to compare us. You're trying to say that I like this person more than I like this person. We're, I, this is just one worker compared to another worker. We're just, a, we're just another part of the body. Listen, you need, we all are needed in the body of Christ. Here's another thing. Is that diversity does not mean division. Paul is showing here that although Paul and Apollos have different gifts and different callings, they were in the mission together. Notice that they didn't talk about the names of their churches. They're not talking about Corinthian Community Church in Calvary, Corinthian Church. Right? And so what we have to realize is that, guys, other churches that are in Tiffin we're doing ministry and we're on the mission field together. There's a couple of pastors that I have been getting together with in Tiffin and I will also sh- I will often share with them we are doing ministry shoulder to shoulder. There's a new church that is coming into town this year and I've met with both of the pastors and I've shared with them, listen, coming into Tiffin is tough. Our church is praying for you. We have been. We've been praying for Grace Community Church for a couple months now. Why? Because it's a tough work. And any other church that gets planted in Tiffin, we will come alongside and we will pray for them. Why? Because we know what it's like. We know what it's like in Tiffin to try to start a new work. And it's no joke. And just as Paul would look on it and just go, man, we're in this whole thing together. It's important for us to know that diversity is not division. We should strive to be one and to realize that we're not in competition. We are literally co-laboring with the Lord. Also, if you noticed in there, it says that God is the one that gives the increase. Sometimes we're called to plow. Plowing is a tough, tough job. If you've ever got into gardening or farming, one of the toughest jobs in the whole thing is the, um, is the plowing. And I will often say that that's, that is church planning. So much of it is that you are just trying to plow straight lines consistently. The plowing is where you really have to put in a lot of work. You've got to get to know people. You gotta share who you are, and people are gonna have to start trusting you. Sometimes we're plowing, then somebody comes behind you and just sprinkles in little seeds. Right? And that job's pretty sweet. Sometimes we get to be the the ones that just sprinkle seeds and then covers it up. And another job that is somebody comes in and waters. And then when things start to come up, you do a little bit of pruning. And then everybody's favorite part is that the harvest comes. Now notice, there isn't the job of giving the increase. And that's something that you, as, as I have become a gardener, I've realized that sometimes you can do everything right, and you get a huge increase or you get no increase. 
Sometimes you can do everything wrong and you still get an increase. One time, Megan and I, we had, what are those uh, red plants called that you get around Christmas time? Poinsettias. We got one of those and we threw it like behind our shed because we had like missed the garbage can. And this poinsettia, just all of a sudden, it had been on its side and I went back there and there was like red stuff or green stuff coming off of it. I literally had thrown it in the garbage and yet it still got the increase. And you have other times where you're doing all this work and you're putting things down, putting holes, and it still doesn't grow. Why? Because that's the Lord's job is to give the increase. Now, a lot of times we want to be the ones that give the increase, but it's not. We can't. It's not our job. So what we have to realize is that sometimes we are doing different jobs, but all together we are partnering with God, and what an honor it is. The last thing in this section is, is that how we are faithful to our calling, we will be tested by God. There's a little section there that's a little bit terrifying. I don't know if you caught it. But it says that our works are going to be tested with fire. Now notice at the end of this section, he's talking about that you're still going to be saved. You say, well, what in the world are you talking about? What is going to be tested with fire? There's going to come a time where we will come before the Lord. And the Lord is going to test everything that we've done. And I can tell you, material things will go up in flames. You say, well, how do I get something eternal? Well, think about what would last. What would be that gold and the different stones that would be make it through the fire? Well, it's things that you're investing into eternally. If you lead a Bible study, you are investing into the kingdom. If you're serving in a ministry at your community church, you are investing into the kingdom. If you are giving to the Lord, that's one way where you're able to just invest because you're saying, listen, I don't want it, Lord. I, I want to give it to you. If you help an old lady cross the street, you are investing your time into the kingdom of heaven. And so listen, it comes to a point where all of those things we will then bring before the Lord. And He will test them through fire. So here's our action item for this. If you were to die today, what would your testing with fire look like before the Lord? And the question to ask yourself is, how can you be partnering with the Lord to have an eternal impact? Now let's move on. And this is where warning number one, it kind of comes to a crescendo. And this is something these verses, these two verses, guys, I think that we should look at and we should just go, oh my God, Goodness, I, I, I didn't really think that it was this serious. It should have that type of an impact. Listen to what he says next. Verse 16 and 17, he says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy which temple you are. Point number three tonight is that division destroys. Okay, now there's two groups. There's two groups that side on what this means. Some people look on at this temple here, and they believe that the temple that Paul is talking about is your body. Now, I think that there's a bit of an error in that, in that there are some groups that look on, and this is where, and this is a sensitive subject, but I'm still going to share it anyways because I think that it's important. There are some groups that teach that when it comes to suicide, this is where it talks about that if you commit suicide, you will not be able to go to heaven. Now, the problem that I see with that is that number one, it doesn't say that in Scripture. Okay, remember, <clears throat> Jesus taught that the only sin that is unforgivable is the blaspheming against the Holy Spirit as taught in Luke 12.10. Everything else will be forgivable except when you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. The temple that it seems that He is referring here 
is to the church. Okay, so although we could look on and we could say, okay, if you if your body is the temple, if you start destroying it, well, then people get stuck in. Not only do they look at suicide and say that that's one way to destroy the body, but then they also look on and say, well, this could be talking about tattoos, and this could be talking about if you do things to your body. Well, then you go down to, boy, if you eat too much butter, you can destroy your body. So if I eat too many brownies, are we talking about that I am destroying? And you get to a point where you start to realize, man, I'm not exactly sure that this sticks. Now, listen to what it says in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And I think that it's going to help us to understand what we're talking about because it's so important. He says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Second thing that we realize is, listen, this temple is the church, and we're all being built in, into it together, and it is a very holy place. When we get together like this, there is something that is happening the Lord brings us together and He is starting to build a group of people into His church. We are the church. And what we have to remember is that Jesus is head over it. Now the temple is also referred to as the bride of Christ. And the perfect husband doesn't let people mess with His bride. And Jesus doesn't let anybody mess with his bride either. Exodus 15.30 says, The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. So we know that Jesus doesn't just sit by and let somebody mess with his bride. The next point is, we have a tendency to rely on God's mercy, but we don't rely on his justice. A lot of times we read verses 16 and 17 and we go, Yeah, you know, when he talks about destroying somebody, but he's just so merciful. You know, God is a God of love. He wouldn't do that to us. And we have this way of just kind of like wiping it off and going, no, he wouldn't do that. He is so loving. He is loving. He's perfectly loving. But he's also perfectly just. Let me give you a couple examples that maybe will help open our eyes to the fact that Jesus doesn't fool around The Lord doesn't fool around whenever he deals with his people. Think about Adam and Eve. What was the big sin that they committed? They kind of just broke a diet. Right? Okay, you can eat this, but don't eat this. And do you ever look on at Adam and Eve and go, Boy, cancer and sickness and death came because they ate a food that they weren't supposed to? Have you ever thought about how many times you have said, I'm going to start this diet? And then you break it a week later. You go, man, like that have I do that a lot. How about with Moses? Do you remember when Moses was leading the people through the promised land and they asked him for water, which was a need, and he struck the rock and he was upset and he had lost his patience and he struck it again. And the Lord goes, Moses, because you did this, you will not go into the promised land. Now, do you ever look on at that and go, doesn't that seem a little harsh? Like, they're buds. How close were they? Like, he's going to let him in at some point, right? You realize that the Lord, when he says something, he means it. How about King Saul? When he lost his patience, right? The prophet told him, wait for me before you go into war. And he didn't. And the Lord took away his kingdom because he was impatient. Have you ever moved in front of the Lord? Have you ever looked on at that and go, man, I've done this stuff before. How about Uzzah, who tried to steady the ark? Do you remember that guy? As As David had become king and he starts leading the ark back out. Remember, there was a special way that they were to carry the ark. And the ark started to fall over and he put his hand up to steady it. 
and it says that God struck him dead, you ever look on at that and go, I mean, he was just trying to help. Like, Lord, why would you? Well, the Lord had given them an order in which to do things, and they went against it. How about Ananias and Sapphira? Do you remember them from Acts? Remember they everybody started selling off their stuff and giving it to the church? I think it was Barnabas that had sold off his stuff and he gave it. And so other people started doing it. And so then they said, hey, we sold our house and they gave the money except they had held a little bit back. Do you know how many people cheat on their taxes right now? And the Lord struck them dead because they did that. Remember Ananias, he came in and they said, hey, did you, did you mess this up? Are you lying? And he says, no, I'm not lying. He struck him dead. And then his wife's fire comes in and they say, hey, did you sell it for this much? And she lies. And then they say, well, you're going to be struck dead too. And then they take her out back. Do you ever exaggerate? Or you, you look on at that and you go, boy, like, I have done so many of those things. Well, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and you realize that if we don't change this, it says that the Lord will destroy us. I want you to go to Luke 13. This is the teaching of Jesus. Luke 13, 6 and 7. Now listen, I, 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 I think that there are so many similarities to what Paul is saying here to what Jesus said. Now, just listen to this parable about the barren fig tree. Jesus is talking. He says, He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and I fertilize it, and if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. What is Jesus teaching here? Listen, he gets to a point where he looks on at each one of our lives, and we're talking about Christians here. He looks on at each one of our lives and he's looking for fruit. He said, well, what in the world is fruit? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. He looks on at our lives and he goes, where's the peace? Where's the patience? Where's the kindness? Where's the goodness? Where's the gentleness? Where's the self-control? And he gets to the point where he looks on and he goes, I don't see any. And it's not doing anything. Remember what he said in John, uh, in, in, in the Gospel of John, when he talks about that you get to a point where sometimes he has to prune us and cut us off because we're useless. And the scary thing is, is that some of us, the Lord has looked on and said, that's enough. And we have scissors to our lives. But what's wild is like the fig tree, there may be somebody that's in our lives And it comes to the Lord and says, no, 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 not yet, Lord, not yet. Let me work with this person. Let me pray for them. Let me, let me pour into them, give them a year. And if nothing happens, then do what you want. And what's scary is there's a lot of people that have been interceding for us. And maybe you're doing that for some others, but it gets to the point where the Lord goes enough. And it's incredibly scary because then I want you to flip to Matthew 21. Just flip a book back. Matthew 21 and 18. He says in Matthew 21, 18, Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it. And he found nothing on it but leaves. And he said, Let no fruit grow on you ever again and immediately the fig tree withered away now this time Jesus isn't teaching about a parable he is illustrating it and what he has said is it's enough enough is enough 
And the, the tough question that we have to ask ourselves tonight is, are we bearing fruit? You say, man, well, what in the world, what can I do? The biggest thing is, is that we have to repent. We have got to get into a healthy relationship with repentance. Listen, we sin so much. And there comes a time where we ask Jesus to eternal, uh, forgive our sins eternally. But there also comes a time where you've got to deal with the stuff that you're doing on a daily basis. Have you ever gossiped about another church? Have you ever gossiped about another pastor? Have you ever led on when you hear about another church struggling and kind of you know, listen and pour into it? Have you ever been a sledgehammer to a work that, that the Lord is doing? Well, if you have, there comes a time where you've got to go, man, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he's talking to me. And if we don't get to a point where we go, whoa, 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 whoa. No, Lord, I, I, had, I had no idea that you were talking about me, man. I, I need to get right with you. And we've got to get to a point where we're consistently doing that. Why? Because we, we have flesh that we're trying to get rid of all the time. And so often we can get stuck in gossip. We can get stuck in division. If you look around at what's happening in our country with politics, and even within the church, it is so easy to step into a place of just entertaining gossip. But we have got to get to a place where we, as a group, we just start to say, no, 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 no. No, that stuff cannot hang out here. We have got to be people that go, Lord, we're going to take 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, incredibly serious because we do not want to be cut down. Lord, if you have got the scissors to my life right now, let me repent. Let me make things right. Because there's, there's a very good chance that that is exactly what is happening in our lives. Because if you look on and you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and you go, man, I have gossip. I have beaten down somebody else's ministry. I have had pleasure at another church's expense. I have been one. Why hasn't the Lord destroyed me? It very well could be that that's what's coming. And we've got to get to a place where we just go, Lord, no, 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 I am so sorry. And that's how we're going to close tonight. After our last point, we're going to have a time of just repentance. We're going to look at David's psalm of repentance and look on and go, no, Lord, there are so many areas. There are so many areas that I have failed you, but I need to make all of those right tonight. Let's finish up before we go there. He says in verse 18, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the things present or the things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. Now our last point tonight is that division deceives. Guys, do not be deceived by the enemy. When as I was talking about repenting, your flesh starts to come in. Man, what if I repent tonight? Somebody looks over and sees me on my knees, man, what are they going to think of me? Listen, that is the enemy coming to you and saying, don't do it. You don't have to get right. Listen, this is a eye-opening, alarming text and a warning from the Lord. And so if there are things that have come on to your heart, do not be deceived as the enemy comes to you and says, make it right next week, make it right tomorrow, all is good. You didn't actually mean it when you said it. Do not be deceived. Next thing that we learn is that there is sin and trespasses in our lives that have to be dealt with. Guys, there's sins that we don't even know that we're committing. It is still a sin. 
the ones that we know that we're committing, those are called trespasses, right? There are things in areas in our lives. Remember that sin, it's like a, um, a term of like a bow and arrow. And the Lord has a mark for us to hit. And when we do not hit that mark, that is sin. We, we, we have to realize that every one of us, the Lord had a plan for us today. And when we don't hit that mark, we are falling into sin. So even if you look on it, you go, man, most of my life is good. There is a good chance that there are things that you still have to bring before the Lord. Don't take advantage of God's mercy. Yes, God is perfectly merciful, but He is also perfectly just. My guess, guys, my guess is that before Adam and Eve sinned and took of the fruit, they had no clue that they were about to bring in sickness, disease. Remember, one of their kids murders the other one. They brought that in. They had no clue that it was about to happen. My guess is, is that Moses didn't think that he missed out on the promised land just because he lost his temper a little bit. My guess is that King Saul didn't think that he'd lose his kingdom because he was um, impatient. My guess is that Uzzah, Uzzah, didn't think that he'd be struck dead for trying to steady the ark. My guess is that Ananias and Sapphira didn't think that they'd be struck dead for exaggerating their income. But we don't understand the justice of God. And so what we learned tonight, and Sarah, you can come back up, is that this text tonight is a warning And what we do with it is what is important. And I would suggest making things right. And how we're going to end, guys, is that wherever you are, if you just want to hang out, make things right, if you need to go to a place, if you just want to sit in your chair, if you want to come up here and get on your hands, I have no idea what that looks like. But here's what I do know. And then when the Lord calls us to him to take a step that might be where you need to be tonight you might need to take a step forward and to bring repentance and i want to i want to go to psalm 51 and look at david's heart for how he repents now remember david had some serious sin in his life and psalm 51 tells of that and this is a good place for us to meditate as we come to him with the heart of repentance let me read this psalm to you He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, And you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Man, do I love that verse. That David looks on and just says, Lord, don't, 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 don't go away from me. I need to be close to you. I need to be near you. I love that. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, 
and my mouth shall show forth your praise, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. And do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. And then they shall offer bulls on your altar. So listen guys, how we are going to close is we're going to sing a, a, a song just to, to play some, some tunes, but this is a time for, for you and for us to make things right for the, with the Lord. And so whatever that looks like, if that means staying in your chair or just going to a place in this room, or if you want to make this an altar, let this be a time where we make things right with the Lord.